the stories of history's dark fellowships strike fear into many hearts. But what are the truths behind the stories? Throughout history, there have been secret organizations striving for influence in political circles. But if the bizarre legends about the Vril Society are true, the organization is particularly unsettling. The Vril Society is the most mysterious uh, German secret society ever in history. Uh, they were originally founded before the Second World War, and their influence uh, reaches out even till today. Its members are said to have included senior figures in the Nazi party, like Hermann Goering, Heinrich Himmler, and even Adolf Hitler. The Vril Society was a dark fellowship. They sought to achieve the mastery of the Aryan race. Before they were able to influence the Nazis, Vril occultists worked in complete secrecy, doing anything to promote Aryan power. What they did, uh, that ranged from straightforward political assassinations, trying to evoke the spirits of the dead, good old-fashioned, what one might call, sexual orgies, and, more sinisterly, human sacrifice. Michael Fitzgerald is one of just a few historians willing to identify the secrets of the Vril Society. Few records exist, but he claims first-hand sources. Some of my information about the Vril Society has come from direct sources. Some of them swore me to secrecy during their lifetime and have now died. So he is now free to offer his assessment. society was a group of people founded at the end of the First World War and it included many people who were to go on to become prominent in the Nazi party. Like any secret society it had its secret practices but what made the Vril Society so unique was its members obsession with an intangible power force called Vril. This power was universal energy it could do anything all currents of harm and healing and so on were enclosed within it. It's similar to the Indian concept of prana in many ways, or the Chinese concept of qi. Chinese philosophers believe that qi is the life energy that runs through us all. The real society believed they could harness this energy. And they believed that real power could be used to gain material power. So they were frantically searching for this real force. Dutchman Theo Pijmans has dedicated 25 years of his life to studying the Vril Society. My research has established that uh, certain bureaus in Nazi Germany were frantically searching for this new uh, energy. Obtaining supernatural power might require supernatural efforts. They sought the power of rule through a variety of different means. There were naturally meditative practices, which were obviously the mainstay of most of their activities. But they weren't meditating to gain inner peace. The theory is that they practice these meditation techniques in order to further the, the, the strength of the will in themselves. If it was a strength that could potentially dominate the world, wouldn't the members of the Vril Society have done more than esoteric meditation to attain it? They were also very involved with what might I call loosely sex magic. There's an enormous history of sexual magic going back to witches and witches using sexual powers. This is nothing new. Members of the society are said to have used the magic of sex to summon the power of Vril. There were some sexual practices that went on in the Vril Society. This carnal method of harvesting Vril was less magical and closer to an excuse for swapping partners. They were swingers. <laughs> Group sex and meditation couldn't really be considered evil and were not exactly unique in the early 20th century. But the Vril Society may have had more sinister rituals. 
the darkest side of the Vril was undoubtedly their belief, which dates back many thousands of years, that to sacrifice a young child will give more power than anything else uh, if you are turning to the darkness. And that is what they did. After the First World War, many illegitimate and orphaned children lived in Bavaria. Children whose disappearance would go unnoticed. And legend had it that the vril of a child was the most concentrated and most powerful. They were seen as being gateways between the astral and the material world in a way that adults were not. So consequently, they were ideal victims for human sacrifice. The human sacrifice. Human sacrifices to harness an intangible energy. Where did this real notion come from? The bizarre concept had been hijacked and distorted from a science fiction novel. After the First World War, a bizarre cult called the Vril Society flourished in Germany. It took its name from a supernatural force, Vril, that could bestow immense power on anyone who could harness it. The concept of Vril was expounded in a book published in 1871 called The Coming Race, written by Edward Bulwer-Lytton. In that book, he describes an underground race called the Vrilia. And they have complete mastery of the Vril force. And with that, they can do almost anything. It was pure science fiction, but it captured an audience and made them firm believers in Vril. And he falls through a crack and finds himself in a subterranean world inhabited by a race of super beings called the Vril Yar, who live down there and who have access to this magical energy, this, this strange electrofluid called Vril. Vril? Vril. 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 It gives them the power to do almost anything. They can use it to heal, they can use it to, to kill. They can also destroy mankind in the blink of an eye. And anyone who harnessed this power could wield it. The protagonist finds out in the course of the novel that a, a child could use Vril to destroy an entire city. So imagine if this Vril existed and got into the wrong hands. Could it be that some aspects of Nazi philosophy stem from ideas in a science fiction novel? Lytton's novel, The Coming Race, in many respects precursed at least some of the ideology that led to the final solution. This superior race, which is explicitly linked in the book with the Aryan races, um, can, can manifest and can, can control. And that just struck a chord in Europe particularly. And following the devastation suffered from World War I, some Germans desperately wanted to associate themselves with such a superior race. Perhaps nobody could believe that this science fiction was fiction. At the end of the book comes with a very serious warning. These subterranean keepers of the Vril could destroy mankind. Should they come up and decide they wanted to colonize the surface of the planet, we would be doomed. It may seem a kind of tabloid truth that one would expect to find in sensational newspapers. But the Vril Society really were consciously dedicated to the service of evil. And by their impact on the founders of the Nazi party, they instilled that evil into the senior leadership of what was to become the most evil regime in the 20th century. Most sources say that the Vril Society was founded in 1918 at a mysterious meeting in the Bavarian town of Berchtesgaden. It was a holiday center and would later house the country retreat of Adolf Hitler. It is said that in a mountain lodge, a group of occultists and high-ranking German nationalists secretly gathered to create a powerful inner circle called the All-German Society for Metaphysics, otherwise known as the Vril Society. Essentially, it was founded by 
uh, two people, Rudolf von Sebottendorf. Von Sebottendorf had been very active in the occult movement. He was a Freemason, an alchemist, and a founder of the Tula Society. Their belief in a mythical civilization was a precursor to Nazi Aryan ideas. The real name was Adam Glauer, and he was the son of an engine driver, but he gave himself, awarded himself a title of nobility. <laughs> In creating the Vril Society, von Sebottendorf was joined by a man who would darkly influence world history. The other main person within it was Dietrich Eckhart. He was said to have strong powers of persuasion, particularly in his anti-Semitic writings. Dietrich Eckhart was Hitler's closest personal friend between 1918 and his death in 1923. Eckhart believed he was paving the road for Germany's own saviour. He was, in many respects, a mad genius. And it's no accident he spent a great part of his time in and out of mental institutions. The founder of the Frill went by a very curious name. John the Baptist. And we all know that in the Bible, John Baptist is a sort of uh, paver of the road for the true Messiah. Eckhart was also one of the masterminds behind the Nazi party. Eckhart saw Hitler as the German messiah. He saw him as the man sent to save the country. And he wasn't the only Vril founder who felt that way. It has been suggested that these two men were joined by two women, mediums responsible for finding the hidden occult truths and harvesting Vril. In those days, it was the golden age of what was known as physical mediumship, where not only were they forever moving objects and table turning and photic levitating, but also they used to produce a substance called ectoplasm out of their bodies. One of these mediums is said to have predicted the new German messiah. During her state of trance, she declared that the apparition she had given form to was going to be the next German messiah, who she proceeded to name as Adolf Hitler. So the Vril Society may have indeed paved the way for the person they would promote as the country's messiah. Their next step would have been to secure his ultimate weapon, Vril. They believed that that would give them power. This occult group of German nationalists may have grown quickly to become an elite inner circle of the Nazi party. Many of the top leaders, including Hitler himself, were members of the Vril Society. Karl Harrer, Anton Drexler and Dietrich Eckhart are three of the most important figures in the transition from the Vril Society to the Nazi party. Eckhart was considered the darkest of them all and dedicated to Hitler's success. He did have certain perverse gifts and not least of which was his ability to uh, train Hitler in the use of, you know, what one might loosely call the power of a human heart and human mind. Hermann Göring, commander of the Luftwaffe, was said to be a member. It is virtually certain that he was introduced to it in around 1920, probably by Dietrich Eckhart. Alfred Rosenberg, Minister of the Third Reich, probably a member. Rosenberg believed that the Aryan race was superior to every other, of course. And, you know, he believed that Jesus was not Jewish, but an Aryan. Rudolf Hess, Deputy Führer, another likely member. Hess believed everything. He used to sleep with magnets under his bed to try and draw off harmful emanations. Martin Bormann, chief of the Nazi party chancellery, also thought to be a member. Martin Bormann was probably considered the most evil one. He was an avowed and open Satanist. He was quite categorical about his desire to exterminate Christianity as well as Judaism because he saw Christianity as simply, as he called it, a Jewish perversion. And the most senior Nazi in the Vril Society, Adolf Hitler himself. Hitler was, by definition, a dark person, but 
He took advantage of the dark fellowship of the Vril society for his own ends. Hitler is said to have used the frenzy surrounding this occult group to his advantage, manipulating its members. Not one of the members had an iota of his ruthlessness and, in a sense, intelligence. Hitler used any means that he could, including the occult fanaticism of the era, as a tool to help his rise to the top. And he saw the whole thing consciously as a means to an end, which was the transformation of Germany and the establishment of himself as its leader. But he did have some deep occult beliefs of his own. He believed to a considerable extent that occult forces, or whatever one likes to call them, that this Vilbao had some kind of reality. Some believe his first occult exposure happened just before World War I in Vienna, when he met a man named Lance von Liebenfels. Von Liebenfels thought Hitler was a natural medium. Von Liebenfels was obsessed with the Aryan occult. He was known to frequent the ancient town of Carnuntum in Austria, where the Germans defeated the Romans in the first century. He invented a whole new religion that he called Ariosophy. <laughs> and he made his bizarre beliefs known publicly. He published a magazine called Ostara, which was full of racial ramblings and bizarre uh, occult philosophy. Hitler was allegedly an avid reader of Liebenfeld's pamphlet. He actually physically advocated that the Jews should be killed simply for being Jewish. With this racist teaching, Hitler was one step closer to Vril and the final solution. But how is it possible that a dark fellowship as bizarre as the Vril Society could even exist, let alone contribute to the most evil regime in modern history? It has had an influence on world history out of all proportion. The confusion surrounding the era offers clues to the Vril Society's influence. It was a very convoluted time. There were a multitude of secret societies. From about 1888, well into the 1920s, hundreds of secret societies formed, reformed, and gave birth to new and even more secret subgroups. Some were dangerous nationalistic orders, like the Serbian Black Hand Society, responsible for the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria. Black Hand Society was largely responsible for the First World War. And many of the era's dark fellowships were simply racist, sharing the sentiments of Lance von Liebenfels, who believed Aryans were gods. He also believed that the Jews were literally children of the devil. The 30 years leading to the formation of the Vril Society was an era obsessed with the strange combination of racial solidarity and the occult. Magic and occult ideas dominated thinking of virtually every class of society in the late 19th century. But of all the mystics of the time, one person's writings may have been the genesis of the phenomenal occult frenzy. Madame Elaine Patrova Blavatsky. I would say that Blavatsky provided the metaphysical framework that has gathered together the vast, vast streams of the ancient wisdom into a coherent system. Blavatsky founded the Theosophical Society in 1875 and established herself as a kind of sage in the occult realm. Theosophists believe in a combination of Asian and occult ideas to promote the concept of a superior Aryan race. She traveled throughout the world for spiritual reasons. Madame Blavatsky wrote, well, several books, but the particularly influential one was The Secret Doctrine. It was based on knowledge she acquired in India and Tibet. She claimed that she got her teachings from secret messages from Mahatmas in the Himalayas. This groundbreaking book, written in 1885, did something no other book had ever done. It combined science and religion. 
Some branches of late 19th century European philosophy drew inspiration from a combination of the occult and Eastern mysticism. One leading proponent of these concepts was Madame Patrova Blavatsky, who managed to combine the precepts of both religion and science. Suddenly science, like with Darwin, had seemed to destroy the possibility of religion, and Blavatsky was showing, oh, you can still be believing in evolution and yet be religious, because it was, this is how it works, you know. Her writings included anti-Semitic notions that fueled later groups like the Vril Society. The secret doctrine had an extreme racist view. Some interpret her writings to say that Semitic people had not evolved as far as the Aryans. But she was actually writing of the ancient Aryans, whose Indo-Iranian name means noble. They had simply migrated further than other races, and so they were more evolved. The misrepresentation of Aryan was we are the master race. Blavatsky's ancient Aryans were not the same as Hitler's 20th century Aryan race. The secret doctrine clearly had anti-Semitic and racist undertones. This is the danger of letting out high-level truths because of the danger of misrepresentation. The secret doctrine was written as a spiritual teaching and a kind of esoteric study of evolution, not an inspiration for the master race. But the racial aspects were the ones that particularly, obviously, appealed to the Nazis. The world has shown the ghastly effects of twisting what is sacred knowledge and perverting it to one's own personal ends. When the Vril Society was founded, Blavatsky's teachings were more popular in Germany than anywhere else in the world. Seriously, it was that influential on German thought that really was. Like the coming race, Blavatsky's book was misunderstood and its ideas were twisted to support the many other racist philosophies rampant in Europe. So by 1918, the time was ripe for the formation of the Vril Society and the search for ultimate power. Vril? Vril. Vril. The Vril Society saw this power as a kind of metaphysical petrol. The Germans needed it because Germany, as we know, did not have fossil fuel reserves. They had a method of creating uh, synthetic fuels, but they were in desperate need for other energies. In addition to their occult methods for finding this energy, they began an actual quest for the all-important Vril. They followed in Blavatsky's footsteps to Tibet. Vril Society member Karl Haushofer organized expeditions to Tibet beginning in 1923. Their mission? Contacting the Aryan forefathers in the cities deep underneath the Himalayas. They would certainly be the guardians of the Vril. And by the third trip, they were measuring the skulls of the locals, convinced the Tibetans were the Aryan ancestors. Eventually, Hitler formed a Nazi organization to track the Aryan race. They spent more money on that than the United States did on the development of the atomic bomb. That would be $20 billion in today's terms. For work that frankly produced no tangible results. And so, in the end, the Germans left. But whether they found Vril there or not, the Germans did bring back one very important thing from Tibetan culture, something Blavatsky had waxed poetic about in The Secret Doctrine. Within its mystical precincts lies the master key which opens the door of every science, physical as well as spiritual. How could Madame Blavatsky have known this mystical figure would become the symbol of hate? A great many of the Vril Society members were conscious Satanists. And these evil men were emblazoned with a symbol, the swastika. Its mystical resonance was of great interest to the Vril Society, and by 1920, it would virtually belong to the Nazis. Previously, though, the swastika had been a symbol of luck and good fortune in Asia. A lot of persons these days forget that before it became an ominous symbol in Nazi Germany, the swastika was to be found everywhere. It was originally meant as a symbol of good fortune. It took on a very tangible meaning that of the letter G, and for Freemasons, the word geometry. 
Well, not only did it stand for geometry and math and so on, but it stood for Nordic, the old Norse gods. It was a symbol of Thor. There was a village in Canada called the Swastika, and they had a female hockey team called the Swastikas, with the Swastika embroidered on their skirts, and it makes very lovely photos. By 1920, it was no longer a benign symbol. In adopting the Swastika, the Nazis did make one significant alteration. Hitler and his cohorts did a funny thing. They changed the direction of the swastika. It no longer turned to the right. His concept of the swastika was very influential. Hitler's swastika turned in the opposite direction, to the left. And the left-hand path is synonymous with evil. The left-hand path, which is something that clearly uh, derives from Roman mythology, and in fact all mythologies, where the evil gods are centered on the left side and the good gods are centered on the right side. This is Hitler's swastika in 1920. It quickly became embedded in Nazi culture, and a variation of it has become known as a sign of the Vril Society. It's found here, in Wevelsberg Castle, the home of Heinrich Himmler, commander of the SS and a suspected member of the Vril Society. He was frantically searching for various means of winning the war, and in the end, one can say it turned him insane, although in my opinion, the seeds of his insanity were already there. Himmler, of course, was probably the most lunatic of any senior Nazi party member. He was mystical, he was a dreamer. He was a real junkie for every cult and wacky idea going. And he was an architect of Nazi ideology. There are fascinating photos, and this I've never understood, of Himmler with his 12-year-old daughter visiting a concentration camp, a death camp. Now, who on earth would take his 12-year-old daughter to a death camp? Perhaps only a man obsessed with absolute power would do that. And such a man would be the perfect candidate to renovate a 16th century castle as a real centerpiece. Within this castle, we find a richness of symbols, of signs, and of occult things of significance that point towards his, well, the fulfillment of his dreams. The North Tower holds the darkest symbols. The North Tower clearly is the embodiment of all that Himmler felt was dear and precious to him, and it points towards an occult significance uh, in his philosophies. A feature of the tower was the solar wheel, or black sun, the occult symbol for the Vril Society. Clearly, this sun wheel meant a great deal to Heinrich Himmler. What the solar wheel exactly was, who can tell? It was, however, likely to impress members of the SS visiting the castle. The SS was seen by Himmler as being part of a mystical order. Himmler wanted an imposing headquarters for his SS cohorts. He performed weddings and funerals for them here. It's alleged that even the full black mass was said to have been performed uh, at Wevelsburg on two or three occasions. But if that ultimate satanic ritual was celebrated at Wevelsburg, it would have been undertaken in another part of the tower, the crypt. In this bizarre room with its excellent acoustics, Himmler created a frightening arena for his elite SS men. There were pedestals around the sides placed possibly for attending rituals and real society meetings, and a peculiar space in the center, probably for Himmler himself. But this is funny in the sense that if this is the center where the acoustics work the best and the most, then what was this, the purpose of the center meant for? Would that have been the place where Heinrich Himmler told about his wildest dreams? Was this nightmarish place the focus of all things real? Did Himmler have it constructed to be the place where the most despicable rituals could take place? This, of course, is one of these things that one will never know for certain. Was it here that Himmler held his notorious Vril experiments? This quack doctor called Rasha, who used to literally freeze prisoners until they were on the point of death, and then 
he would put naked prostitutes against their bodies to see if that would revive them and then if so they were then in instructed to have sex with them and then all the temperatures would be taken Himmler called it animal magnetism but it was essentially real based Himmler may have been searching for real through sexuality of course it was ridiculous because 50 percent of the male subjects used to die the experiments were undoubtedly inspired by Himmler's subscription to the notion of real. Were these experiments held here in Himmler's center or elsewhere within the castle walls? Unfortunately, there are no written records or living eyewitnesses to reveal with certainty exactly what occurred within the walls of Himmler's Wivelsburg. The Vril Society was unique among the secret societies of the era. One reason was that it included women as members. Every woman in the Reich stands ready as any man to fight and die in the service of the fatherland. And, you know, this is true. This is true. There were probably more women than there were men in many respects. Which is very important to realize because a lot of the Masonic groups were male only and a lot of the esoteric groups were male only. But not the Vril Society. After all, the females in the coming race were superior to the males. Women were seen, really, in a way, as being like almost divine. Women would have been welcomed because their feminine energy was required to properly attain Vril. But Hitler's personal view was far more practical. He actually felt that women were actually the soul of the nation and that they were going to carry on the legacy of National Socialism. It is believed that two women became senior leaders of the Vril Society. Countess von Reventloff was possibly the most well-known one. And it's possible that her prominence led to her death. She suffered a mysterious and fatal bicycle accident in 1918, shortly after the Vril Society's inauguration. As she got um, executed, Countess von Reventloff's assassins were members of the German Communist Party people strongly opposed to the National Socialists. Ludendorff's wife, who was the only other one that was of comparable importance, she broke with the Vril Society at a fairly early stage. That may have been when her husband, Erich Ludendorff, became disillusioned with politics and left the Vril Society and the Nazi Party in 1923. Most of the women in the Vril Society served two primary purposes. Sex was seen as a national duty. Following World War I, one primary purpose of women in Germany was to replace the lost soldiers by having many German babies. There was actually a huge drive towards birth to increase productivity. And the prospect of making babies took on an element of fun at the time. Anything that could be an escape or fun would be good. The real society may have taken fun a step further into sex for occult power. It's combined power with pleasure. It was kind of like nationalization of the sexual instinct. And in a dark fellowship, sexual instinct might invite sexual magic. Women in the real society were often mediums. In an era obsessed with the occult, there were many practicing mediums. And mediums were typically women. With secret societies dabbling in the occult rampant throughout Germany in the 1930s, successful mediums were in great demand. And the real society held such women in high esteem. They were considered to be particularly receptive channels between the ordinary world and the astral world. Well, it sounds like a fascinating uh, and novel concept, but clearly it is not. I mean, in Germany, we had female mediums doing exactly that. They didn't have any political influence in any way, and that what they essentially did was try and channel in the real power and then translate it out into the rest of the people in the room. A kind of psychic photosynthesis, one might say. One bizarre legend suggests that the female founders of the group were receiving messages about Vril from other galaxies. Well, it's been alleged that, um, that, that the Vril Society was 
able to contact beings from Aldebaran and so on. That depends to a certain extent on your point of view. It's not strange that these ideas would evolve or mutate into ideas of uh, long-haired women communicating with people underneath the Earth and on other planets. Why not? It makes a better story. It's more fun. The idea of two long-haired mediums communicating with other galaxies through automatic writing was not so outrageous in 1918. There is this fascinating book that I held in my hand just yesterday. It was published in 1823 and it's called uh, Voyages to the Sun, the, uh, the Moon and Other Planets. And it was written by a female medium at that time, 1823. So clearly the idea that two female mediums are involved in communicating with an interstellar civilization on Aldebaran in 1970 is not new. And long hair also had a long tradition. The long hair of the women is partly a throwback, of course, to the old days of the Valkyries, maidens and so on. I wonder how much of this uh, is borrowing themes from Wagner. Naturally, not all women of the Vril Society were long-haired beauties. But all of the Vril Society legends, like everything surrounding the organization, were larger than life. Exaggeration was part of the plan, and that exaggeration included Heinrich Himmler's nightmarish castle. This all could have been a stage prop, a setting, a fitting setting for Himmler's plans and Himmler's evil dreams. It's a very clever ploy of propaganda. Propaganda was an integral part of the entire Nazi culture. Ensuring that the Third Reich would survive in our darkest dreams. So what was real? And what, if anything, has become of the Vril Society? The, the problem with uh, researching the Vril Society today is that clearly uh, this concept attracts people of unsavory character. <laughs> Today, there are many people still obsessed with Nazis, Hitler, and the most evil side of the occult. They intermingle legend, fantasy, and propaganda with the scarce facts. Some also believe in the possibility that intergalactic flight could be achieved through the Vril Society. The Nazis were, at the very last two years of the war, working on secret project. Their ultimate scheme was the Flying Disc Project a concept based on real society ideas. We can clearly read in the 1930 pamphlets published by uh, the Vril Society that yes, there were blueprints, there is even a whole chapter explaining what uh, an ideal spaceship might look to them if the right technology was being used. Yeah, the real sources were actual blueprints. I know that devices were built with the technology that the Vril Society was propagating well before the Second World War. We don't know for sure whether Nazi scientists created flying saucers, but the Vril Society did envision them. Am I skeptical of the whole Nazi UFO myth? Yes. On the other hand, there are certain tales that I still find hard to discount. But the evidence has vanished. The strange thing is that we know that these devices were built, but we can't find them anywhere anymore. It has even been suggested that real technology was adapted for the US and Russian space programs. I don't think so. I think they would be further ahead than anybody else on this planet. So we're left to wonder what became of real technology and what became of the real society. Well, the irony of history is that Nazi Germany towards the end of the world war pretty much evolved into becoming the Vrilya themselves. In some ways, Hitler's Nazis did become a subterranean society. They built bunkers connecting one Nazi member to another and countless tunnels containing weapons factories. They did this, uh, as is the official stance, because uh, Allied bombers were bombing German cities and German factories into smithereens day after day, night after night. One place where they built weapons was the tunnel complex in Nordhausen. We know that they built their V1s and V2s there. Hundreds of very real V1 and V2 rockets built underground soared through the skies to destroy their enemies. It has been said that the V stands for Vril. If true, Nazis and the Vrilja have become one. My theory is that the search for this force changed themselves into well, the carriers of the forest. More than 60 years after the fall of the Third Reich, where are the remnants of the Vril Society? Are they gone? Or are the ancient relics hiding away somewhere? 
does a new regime exist among us, still plotting and scheming? When you look at the tapestry of signals that I'm receiving, that I have received over the years, one can say that yes, there still is a frail society, but not comparable to what it was once before. There still could be devotees of a fictional power amongst us today. Frill in itself, if it had been there yesterday, it still is here today. And Vril belief does still exist. Every atom is basically 99% Vril energy. Today in America, a small religious organization exists called the Church of Vrilology, where Bob, the Vril master, calls on the Norse gods for Vril balance. Hail Odin! Though they seem a bit different than the norm, the Church of Vrilology is not the remnants of the evil Vril society. They're simply a group of people trying to find their way to the light. What we teach is to develop a relationship between the subconscious and the conscious so that we can, through the conscious mind, take the Vril energy and transform it into what we want in our lives. The original occultist members of the Vril Society were at the other end of the spectrum, looking directly and deeply into the darkness to harvest and execute ultimate power.